why you should expect God to heal your body. Six reasons why you should expect God to heal your body. And uh, Carrie last week taught because we were out of town. And I want to say thank you, Carrie, for a wonderful <coughs> job. Praise God for that. And uh, so we skipped a week, so I'm just going to catch up real quick. First, number one reason why you should expect <coughs> God to heal your sick body is because He's an unchangeable God. He does not change. What He did yesterday, He will do today. I, the Lord God, am one God, and I change not, He says. So we know that Jesus, who's the same yesterday, today, and forever, if he was a healer then, he's a healer today. He hasn't changed his mind about healing you. He's an unchangeable God. So you should expect him to heal your sick body. Second reason why you should expect, why you should expect him to heal your sick body is because there was only one atonement that was made by the blood of Jesus that purchase both your body and your spirit at the same time. Therefore, glorify God in your spirit and in your body, which were bought with a price, which are <coughs> God's. He purchased you, spirit, soul, and body, at the same time on the cross. Psalm 103 tells you the same thing. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits. Bless the Lord, O my soul who heals all of your diseases and pardons all of your sins. At the same time, in the same breath, at the same cross, Jesus purchased you in your body and in your spirit. He set you free at the same time. So you should be expecting God to heal you based on the atonement. Okay? The third reason we talked about the last time was that all sickness is a result of Satan's work when he uh, introduced sin into the world. And Christ uh, was manifest that he might destroy all the works of the devil. First John 3.18 tells you that. That for this purpose was the Son of Man manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil. The works of Satan is sickness and disease. Jesus came to destroy the works of Satan on the earth. Acts chapter 10 and verse 38 says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. You notice who the oppressor is and who the healer is there. Okay, So we know that uh, when Satan introduced sin into the world, sickness became a part of that. When Jesus was manifest, he was manifest to destroy the works of the devil. So you should be expecting God to heal you on that basis. Okay? So we started reason number four uh, a couple of weeks ago, but I think we only just gave you a couple of scriptures. Uh, so we're just going to go back and we're going to read we're going to visit this whole episode here. This, no, reason number four is this. Reason number four that you should expect God to heal your sick bodies because the very same Holy Spirit's anointing that anointed Jesus and raised him from the dead is still present in the earth today. Amen. Okay? John 14, verse 16. I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, and he will abide with you forever. That scripture right there tells you that he will abide or he will live with us forever. Now, let's just kind of look at that for just a minute and read a couple of other verses to go along with that so we can grab a hold of it. He says, I will pray the Father. And he will give you another comforter that he may abide or live with you forever. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it sees him not, neither does it know him, but you know him. For he dwells with you and he shall be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come unto you. I will not leave you without a father. That's important that you grab a hold of that. Why? Because verse 16 
There's that word another. He says, I will give you another comforter, another parakletos, another intercessor, another advocate, another one who comes alongside of you. But the word another is the Greek word alos, A-L-L-O-S, and it means another of the identical kind. In other words, you can't tell the difference from the Holy Spirit. You can't tell the difference between him and Jesus. Wow. Notice what he says here. This is why it's important that you get this. He says the spirit of truth. Jesus is what? The way, the truth, and the life. Okay? Whom the world cannot receive because it doesn't see him. Neither does it know him. But now watch what Jesus says. But you know him because what? He lives with you. Who lived with the disciples, or who should I say the disciples lived with? Jesus, right? For he dwells with you, he lives with you, but then he says, and he shall be what? In you. Remember the Holy Spirit had not yet entered into man yet because Jesus had not yet resurrected from the dead. So Jesus identifies this same anointing, the same person of the Holy Spirit that was in Jesus. If you just read John chapter 16, it'll actually give you a little bit more clarity there. But the same Holy Spirit that was in Jesus, Jesus said, is walking with you at that time. The disciples later on shall be in you. Jesus said he'll live with you forever. So the same anointing, the same Holy Spirit, that was upon Jesus to raise the dead, to heal the sick, to cast out demons, to cleanse the lepers. All of the miraculous work that Jesus did, we know that is still resident in the world today. And even better than that, he's resident in you today. And if the Holy Spirit is resident in me, that means that same anointed, miracle-working, resurrection power abides in me. Abides in you as a believer. So go with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. <clears throat> I think it's important that we understand that the working of the Holy Spirit moved forward after Jesus ascended. Okay? Some people don't understand. They feel like Jesus came, did his work, Lived on the earth 33 and a half years, resurrected, sits on the right hand of the Father, and we're just supposed to talk about him until he comes again. We're not supposed to act on his behalf. Well, I've got good gospel news for you. We're supposed to act on his behalf. <laughs> we're supposed to move in the power and authority. So we can see a lot of that in the work of Paul and Peter and John and all the other disciples in the early church and other people that weren't mentioned. I like this here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. It says, or I'm sorry, chapter 1, verse 5. Okay. First Thessalonians, chapter 1, verse 5. Hard enough to say Thessalonians. <laughs> let, let alone First Thessalonians. <laughs> For our gospel did not come unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance, as you know what manner of men you were, we were among you for your sake. Now, that word that you see there, the word power, that is the word dunamis. And it's important that you grab a hold of that word dunamis. Okay? The word power there is the word dunamis. Our gospel did not just come to you in word only, but in dunamis and in the Holy Ghost. And it's important that you understand that because remember, as we've talked to you before, that in the Greek language, if it means to be a different word, they will use a different word. If it's used in one application to mean the same thing, in another application is exactly what it means. And the reason that that is important there is because Luke chapter 24, verse 49, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, these are just some examples. 
Luke chapter 24 and 49 to picture this. Jesus in the upper room with the disciples. And he tells them to wait in Jerusalem until they be endued with power, with dunamis from on high. That word uh, endued literally means to, be, to step into a garment. So he says that you need to wait into Jerusalem until you step into this garment. You put on the power of God or it comes over you and clothes you with the dunamis from on high. Then if you go to Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, Jesus said you shall receive dunamis after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be an evidence producer in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. The same dunamis power that was on Jesus was on Paul. Jesus said would be on the disciples, clothe them with the same exact dunamis power. Paul talks to the church in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7. He says, you have not been given the spirit of fear, but of dunamis. Hmm. Ah, yeah, you've been given the spirit of what? Power, love, and soundness of mind. You've been given the spirit of dunamis, love, and soundness of mind. The same exact power, dunamis, Power that was given to the early church on the day of Pentecost is the same dunamis power that is resident in the church as it goes down through the ages. Jesus, when he came out of the wilderness after being tempted for 40 days, 40 nights, tempted by the devil in the wilderness, the scripture says that he returned out of the wilderness in the dunamis of the Holy Spirit. The same power that was attested to the Holy Spirit is the same power that's attested to you and to me as a body of believers. So you should be expecting the power of the Holy Spirit to be at work within you, producing miracles, signs, and wonders, not just for others, but for you as well, directly in your own body, okay? So, if he was working in the early church, according to our point number one, he's an unchangeable God, then he should be doing the same thing here. Right? Follow that? Okay? So he's working through the church today. Remember, John chapter 14 tells us, These things shall you do, and greater things, because I go unto the Father. So we should be doing the same things and the same power, same anointing of the Holy Spirit that Jesus did when he walked on the face of the earth. Okay, go with me to Romans. And again, I want to reiterate how important it is that you bring your Bible. Because this is where you should really be writing a lot of stuff in your little side margins and side notes. Because when you read the word, those little side notes will trigger your memory. It will trigger what the Holy Spirit has put in you. And you go, oh yeah, I remember that now. So it's real important. Romans chapter 14. And again, Paul's demonstration concerning dunamis. Look at verse 18 of chapter 15 of Romans. For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not done by me to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed through many mighty signs and wonders by the dunamis of the Spirit of God so that from Jerusalem and round about unto Illyricum I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. There is so much in here I could spend all night talking about those two verses. But you need to see something. Number one, 
Look at verse 18. I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not done by me to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed. You need to see the importance of signs and wonders. You need to see the importance of miracles. You need to see the importance of opening blind eyes and seeing deaf ears here and making crippled people walk. There is more to it. A lot of people think, well, man, that guy's going to build a big ministry because he's got these things going on, these things going on, da 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 But listen, it's not all about that. It's about building the kingdom of God. And when you see that word obedient there, it means this. It means to bring them into compliance or submission. Notice Paul says this. I'm not going to dare to speak of any of those things which Christ had not done by me to make the Gentiles, the unbelievers, to become compliant and obedient. How did they become compliant and obedient to the gospel? Through many signs and wonders by the dunamis of the Spirit of God. You see that? So that from Jerusalem and round about into Elycrium, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. What's interesting about this word fully, one of the definitions of the word fully here in the Greek means to verify. And you need to grab that. Because if you look back at it, it says that he went by the mighty signs, wonders, power of the Spirit of God into those places and he verified what he spoke of the gospel by the signs and the wonders. Signs and wonders prove the resurrection of Christ. Signs and wonders prove the lordship of Christ. Okay? So, <clears throat> you cannot fully preach the gospel unless signs and wonders are there. You only have a half gospel. I know that's hard for some people to grab a hold of, but it's absolute truth. How did, what did Jesus tell the disciples to do in Luke chapter 9, Luke chapter 10? Go into the city, do this, do that, do that, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons, and declare that the kingdom of God has come unto you. How did it verify that the kingdom of God came to them? Through the signs and the wonders and the miracles. You follow that? We have a full gospel message when you preach the resurrection of Christ, when you preach the blood of Christ, when you preach the baptism of the Holy Spirit, when you preach signs, wonders, and miracles, that we have a powerful, all-living, all-powerful God who changes not. And because of that, we need to have that full understanding with us and we need to expect Him to heal us because of the residence of the Holy Spirit within our life. Do you follow that? Just real quickly, in, in regards to this particular portion of Scripture in Acts 15, turn with me to Acts chapter 4. I just want you to see that the disciples... When they prayed, they prayed the same thing that Paul just demonstrated there in Romans chapter 15, verse 18 and 19. Acts chapter 4, verse 29. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings. Remember, they just got threatened not to preach in the name of Jesus and all of that stuff because a guy got healed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto your servants that with all boldness we may preach your word. I know your King James says speak, preach, speak, same thing. Exactly. So he tells them, Lord, grant us boldness to preach your word. Look at verse 30. How is they going to get boldness to preach the word? By stretching forth your hand to heal that mighty signs and wonders may be done by the name of your holy child Jesus hmm 
Romans chapter 15. Isn't that what Paul just said? He verified the gospel, the preaching of the gospel, with signs and wonders. Follow that? By the dunamis of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Romans chapter 8. Verse 11. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall, everybody say this word, also, also. quicken your mortal body by his what? Spirit. spirit that does what? Well in me. Wells in you, that lives in you. The same power, the same resurrection power of the Holy Spirit that raised up Jesus from the dead lives in you, shall quicken. Quicken is just an old English term that just simply means to make alive. That Holy Spirit gives life, makes alive, what part of you? Your mortal body. Your spirit man is already made alive. The moment you receive Christ, that which was dead is now alive. So he's not dealing with your eternal life. He's dealing with your natural life right here on planet Earth. And that amazing thing there in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 3 and verse 6, it says that the letter kills, but the spirit makes alive. It's the same word that is used in Romans chapter 8 concerning the quickening of your mortal flesh. The spirit makes alive. Same exact word. Okay, so we know that it requires the working of the Holy Spirit in your body to bring life to your body, to also bring that anointing to set you free from sickness and disease. Now we're in Romans chapter 8, go to verse 26. This has been a scripture that has been kind of misconstrued over the years. So all kinds of ways to interpret this. We know that he's dealing with intercession in this portion of Scripture. Okay? Let's just go ahead and back up to verse 25, just kind of encapsulate this here. But if we hope for that what we see not, then do we with patience wait for it? Likewise, or in the same way, the Spirit also helps our infirmity. For we know not what we should pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searches the heart knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Okay? Now, we would all agree that really he's dealing in the subject of intercession right there, wouldn't you? That we don't know how to pray sometimes. I mean, you just find yourself like, huh, help God, what do, how do I pray? How do I get a hold of you in all of this mess? How can I do that? So the Holy Spirit, he comes alongside, remember, he's the paracletos, one who comes alongside. He's the advocate, your helper, your comforter, okay? But there's something there that we've got to grab a hold of as well. Notice it says the Spirit himself helps our infirmities. That word infirmities actually is a crossover word. It means not only your weaknesses. How I many of you know we have weaknesses? We need help with a lot of things. But it also means feeblenesses. It also means disease. Okay? 
So he's dealing both with physical ailments as well as he is with our human weaknesses. There's two things there that he's really dealing with. When you grab a hold of, if you could, you could just please wrap your mind around this, this is awesome. And what will help you to understand that is you see the word helpeth or helps there? Okay, he helps. Literally, that word means to take hold against together with. <laughs> to take hold uh, uh, to take hold against together with. Other words, he comes alongside and for to cooperate with. Does that make sense to you? So if you take hold together against something with someone, you're cooperating in that. So we're not alone. That's just the part that I really want you to grab a hold of. You're not alone in your infirmities, whether it be a malady, whether it be a sickness, whether it be a, a, a disease, whatever weakness, whatever it might be. So literally, Romans 8.26 here shows us this, that the Holy Ghost takes hold against our sicknesses together with someone. See that? He takes hold against our sicknesses together with someone. This is important. Who's that someone? You are. In other words, you have a part in doing that. And this is where a lot of people get uh, to a point where they're just discouraged because nothing's happening. I did this and nothing's happening. I did this and nothing's happening. The Holy Spirit is wanting to take hold together with you against that sickness waiting for you to do your part in that. Wow. You follow that? Okay? So what is our part? We need to do our part. Remember Jesus said to the, to the lepers, go show yourself to the priests. Take up your bed and walk. Go wash in the pool of Siloam. We've seen it many times in our meetings when, when the Holy Spirit is moving, people are being here, we have words of knowledge, and then all of a sudden, somebody will tell somebody, the Lord will have us tell that person to go do this, or to go do that, or go take care of this, and, and do that. And we have seen it so many different times. I, I keep going back to one meeting that we had in Murphy, there in the gymnasium, that one night, this, the whole message that the Lord had me preach that night was this, John chapter 15 and verse 7. If you abide in me and my word abides in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. And the command was, if you have something that you have need of tonight, ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. And every time somebody would come and the Lord would have them do something, as soon as they did that, they were healed. The one I bring to remembrance was Jeff, guy with the feet that just were all, I mean, just peely and red and all that. He could, Lord had him run around that sanctuary. I don't remember how many times it was. And that was a big building over there. But he was completely and totally healed. Completely and totally healed. I don't remember all the other things that went on that night. But the one word that the Lord just had me just stand at the microphone and speak. And then the person would do whatever. they get healed. Then he'd have me speak that again. John 15 and 7. My word abides in you and you abide in me. Shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. There's your part. There's your part. If you're going to get what God has for you, you have to do your part. Though you need to work alongside of the Holy Spirit so that you can be set free from that infirmity. And notice that it says that you'll get the mind and the will of the Father. And what's so important about that is that if you ask anything according to my will, that he will hear you and that you will have the petitions that you have desired. Okay, so I think it's important that we understand the working of the Holy Spirit and our part with Him. 
Don't give up. Say, well, God just didn't want me to have it. No. Do your part. Okay? Reason number five why you should expect God to heal you. Go with me to Mark chapter 16. And also to James chapter 5. Reason number five why you should expect God to heal you because it was the great commission and it was a command of Jesus or a command of God for you to call for prayer to be healed. Hmm. Great Commission. We know Matthew 28. We know that is, but I like the Great Commission as it's worded in Mark's Gospel, verse 15. And he said unto them, Go into all the world and preach the Gospel to every creature. Remember, you can't fully preach the Gospel until what? There's a demonstration of dunamis, right? So we're going to see it right here. He that believes is baptized shall be saved, but he that believes not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow that those that are believing. Mm -hmm. Your King James says, them that believe. Literally in the Greek, them that are believing. There's an action to that. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And Paul was so glad of that in Acts chapter 28. Remember that viper attached onto his hand out of the firewood? And everybody thought he was going to die. He just shook it off in the fire and just kept on preaching and nothing happened to him. Okay? They shall take up serpents. If they drink any deadly things, it shall not hurt, harm them. And they shall do what? Lay hands on the sick and they shall what? They shall be well. They shall recover. That's a command of the Lord. They shall lay hands on the sick. You and I are commanded by the Lord. If they're sick, you need to lay hands on them. Do you see that? You know why we don't do that? Because we don't believe anything's going to happen. Fear. Fear. We're afraid. What if God doesn't? Well, you just kick fear right out the window. What if God doesn't? Try to put the shoe on the other foot. What if God does? <laughs> what if God does? So we have a command from him that we are to lay hands on the sick and we shall see them recover. James chapter 5. Here's another one that people get in all kinds of religious debates over. How many of you understand the Word of God is not for debate? Not even up for question. It's up for faith. <laughs> Just read it and believe it. So simple. Jesus said, have the faith of a child. Verse 14. Is any sick among you? Well, let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. The Lord shall raise him up, and if he has committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Okay? <clears throat> Here's a direct command from Jesus. It says that if you're sick, you need to call for the elders of the church and expect to get healed. Expect to get healed. Amen. Now, there's several things here. Some people believe that they mean here that this person is spiritually sick because they talk about if he's committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Well, let's dispel that dumb thought, shall we? James chapter 1 deal says that James writes to the beloved brethren in the church. 
These people aren't spiritually sick. They're saved. They're believers. They're the church. So he's not dealing with sinners there. He's dealing with the church. Now, look at that word in verse 15, that word save. That word save there is the Greek word sozo. S-O-Z-O. That word is used 110 times concerning healing in the New Testament. I think he's trying to make a point. That same exact word sozo is used 110 times in the New Testament with regard to healing. And every time that Jesus healed someone, that word sozo was used. Let's just look at a few examples, shall we? Go with me to hold your place in James because we're coming back. Go to Matthew. And go to uh, Matthew chapter 9. Verse 22. This was regard to the woman with the issue of blood. But Jesus turned him about, and when he saw her, he said, Daughter, be of good comfort. Your faith has sozoed you. Okay, your King James says, made you whole. Okay, but that word there is actually translated out sozo, and it simply means to make whole in every aspect of your being. Where do we find that word sozo? You find it in your Greek concordance. Okay. Go with me to Mark chapter 6. And look at verse 56. And wherever he went into villages or cities or country, they laid the sick in the streets and besought him that they might touch, if it were, but the border of his garment. And as many as touched him were made sozo. Again, your word there is whole, but it's the word sozo for being healed of every infirmity, okay? Now, go with me to Mark chapter 10, verse 12, uh, 52. Blind Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, sitting by the roadside begging, okay? Jesus said to him in verse 52, and Jesus said unto him, go your way, your faith has made you sozo. You notice that Jesus, every time he says that, it deals with what? Your faith has made you so-so. You're working with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Get you healed. Okay? Luke chapter 8. Look at verse 48. Again, concerning the woman with the issue of blood. Daughter, be of good comfort. Your faith has made you Sozo, go in shalom. Interesting. That was Luke chapter 8, verse 48. Daughter, be of good comfort. Your faith has made you sozo. Go in shalom. There's something that happens when you get healed. There's a peace that comes all over you. And the shalom also deals not only with her physical being or her spiritual being but that talks also about her body they're used in conjunction in that particular mm -hmm. verse of scripture hmm hard to have peace in your body if you don't have healing in it right okay Luke 17 like I said these are just a few of them like I said it's used 110 times so you'll have to do your own research on that <clears throat> talking about 10 lepers Verse 19, and he said unto him, because there's one that came back to give glory to God. And he said unto him, arise, go your way. Your faith has made you sozo. <laughs> I 
I like hole a whole lot better than that. Well, I said, How's your neck? I said, oh, it's so so. Not so so. Not so so. So so. S O Z O. I'm hearing so so here for years, and it's not in my Bible. Whole so. is a good word when you're doing it in the English, but I need you to see that that word ties in with physical healing in your body and where it's used because people take James chapter 5 out of context thinking that it's dealing with sin in the church or sin sinners needing to be saved when he's not dealing with that at all he's using it in uh, the context of physical healing for your body okay so James <clears throat> referring here to those who are sick he says the prayer of faith shall sozo, verse 15, shall sozo, shall save the sick. Sick is the word in the Greek, K-A-M-N-O, 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 Kamno. And it means tired, exhausted, sick, ill, literally it reads out this way. The prayer of faith shall save the one being sick or exhausted. Feeble, indigent, diseased. That's what that word sick deals with. Now notice here, because you got to see that the instruction is to pray. The instruction is to believe for your sick body. There's a command from Jesus to call the elders of the church, get prayed for, and watch him raise you up. Because there's one more word there that I need you to see. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. In Mark's gospel, the first chapter in verse 31. You don't have to turn there now, but you can later. Remember, Peter's mother-in-law was sick. And the scripture says that Jesus went and raised her up. That word raise literally means to rouse from a lion or sitting position that comes from either being diseased or from death has nothing to do with somebody in sin. It has everything to do with somebody who is sick or diseased. And you have a promise from God when you follow the command that he said he would raise you up. Pretty awesome, isn't it? What does it take? Every time Jesus said, what? Your what? Faith. Your faith. These signs shall follow them that are believing. I think it's misconstrued when you read that and say, these signs shall follow them that believe. It just simply means that maybe they believe one time and they stop their believing. But his implication is, is that you believe and you keep on believing. You never stop in your believing. You continually to believe. Amen? Do you follow that? I think there are plenty of reasons why you need to expect God to heal you. <laughs> yes, Ray. In, in uh, Mark, if you in Mark, not Mark, James, my brother and I, the pastor, he was having a terrible problem with his shoulder. He was going to go to the hospital and have, and have it operated on. I said, have you had anybody lay hands on you? for you. In James. Right. Oh, no, that doesn't belong anywhere. That's what it is. It's taken out of context. It's taken out of context. That's exactly what he said. Don't lay your hands on me. I said, oh, I won't. I wouldn't take my hand out. It wouldn't do any good anyway. Yeah, see, people have been taught, they even taught that Mark's gospel doesn't contain the last part of the 16th chapter. There's all kinds of things that people want to take up. The devil wants people to just walk in a place of being infirm and sick. Okay? If you give me just two seconds, I'm going to tell you reason number six so we can start something next next week. Okay? 
Reason number six that you need to expect God to heal you is because of his promises to you. Because of his promises to you. Okay? You need to expect that. God, I mean, you understand, God doesn't break any of his promises. Uh, Psalm chapter 89 and verse 34 says, I will not alter one word that's gone out of my mouth, nor will I break any one of my covenants. That's Psalm 89, 34. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 20. All the promises of God are yes and amen unto the glory of the Father by us. God made a promise to you. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 20. John 15, 7, which we've already talked about. If you abide in me and my word abides in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be given unto you. Is that a promise? Oh, you bet it is. John 15, 7. Uh, Matthew 18, verse 19. If any two or three of you are gathered together in my name and touching on any one thing, you shall have whatever you ask and it shall be given unto you. Matthew 18, 19. That tells you that. That's a promise. Okay? Mark 11, 22 through 24. Kenneth Hagin's Famous verse of scripture. <laughs> you believe when you pray that you receive, you shall have whatsoever you say. Okay? That's, is that a promise? Yes. Absolutely it's a promise to you. Uh, John chapter 14, 13 and 14. Uh, James chapter 5, verse 14 through 16. We just read those. Ephesians 3.20. Oh, I like that one. My God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all you can ever ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Thank you, Woo! Jesus. Glory to God. <laughs> that is a promise. Amen? Amen? So you should expect Him to heal you simply because He made you a promise that He would. I like the scripture where they came to the tomb and Jesus wasn't there and the angel said, He's not here. He is risen. Just as He said <laughs> you know what just as he said be ye sozo <laughs> according to your faith that's a promise so I want to encourage you and I'll get to you in just a second I want to encourage you to work with the Holy Spirit work with the word <coughs> Stand firm. Don't let things around you dissuade you. Stay on course for what God has and expect God to heal you. That Some people would just run me out of town if they heard me say those words. Expect God. No, he told me to expect him to do those things. Prove me herewith, he said. That's expecting. <laughs> right? Amen. Yes. I liked what the story of blind Bartimaeus is when Jesus called for him, he threw away his garment yep. and went forward. And that what he was saying is, I am no longer a beggar. Because he was wearing the beggar's garment because he was blind and that's how he got his money. But he was expecting, so he threw that garment away and says, I'm getting healed today and it's happening. And he cooperated with the Lord in that way. Amen. By throwing away the thing that was that identified him. That's right. Amen. Very good part. And that's what we have to do. Amen. Praise God. 